Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm just gonna say he's a he's a regular guest now because uh, I am gonna be picking his brain all season long. I already did it in the preseason. Do you believe Fred Katz of the Athletic that the last time we talked, the Knicks had not even played a real game yet? It's unbelievable. I just I can't wait for my promotion to friend of the show. How many appearances <laughs> do I get for that? I don't even know who's a friend. Who wants to be friends with this with this show? I, I hate that expression, friend to the show. Oh, friend to the show on. Just means here's my friend. Friend yeah. to the show. It sounds so professional as if there's there's this inanimate object, the show that's capable of befriending people who come on. No, nah, it's just a way more professional way of saying, like, all right, I'm having my friend on today. I couldn't get anybody better. Uh, well, for, in that instance, then we definitely have a couple of friends of the show. Where it's 4 p.m. We have an episode due the next morning. Hey, what are you doing right now? Um, you you are in a higher. You should be honored that you are not in that class. You don't want to be in that class. Oh, I, I always want to be in friend of the show class. <laughs> OK, well, in that case, then I'll start texting you when we, when we yeah. uh, our gets canceled or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, welcome to the Knicks beat. I feel like I know you were already a member of the Knicks beat when we last spoke, but it feels like you've been fully indoctrinated now. Um, what a, well, I was about to say what a 20 games it's been, what a 21 games it's, it's been. Um, let me ask you this before you even get into the team. How's it been so far this year? Are you enjoying it? It's been good. It's fun. I get to watch basketball for a living. There are worse things in the world. I always say if I were an accountant, like I would get fired so quick. Cause I'd show up to work on a Tuesday. They'd be like, you get those reports in be like, no, the Kings were down 28. And I just had to see what their third unit looked like. There aren't many opportunities. And, and I just wanted to see if, you know, there were any, you know, gems on the bench. And I just, I never, I never wrote it. And then I'd get fired. And, and so this is the only job where I'd be like, no, I was watching the Kings game last night. And they're like, good, hard worker. Like so what a hard worker watching the Kings game. Going over and above. Um, I don't think Alvin Gentry wanted to watch much of the Kings game last night. Which it's sad for him. Um, Those post game quotes. My oh my goodness. goodness! I mean, when you, he apologized in the beginning of the post game presser, and then again before he left, you had to apologize twice to the fan base. That's, that's not what you want. Um, so things are not quite that bad in Knicks land, actually. So we we were recording this the morning after they lost to the Nets. Um, I want to start here. I, it's always tough for me to properly judge this because I'm a fan of the team. I root for the team. Um, I feel better about the team this morning with a record of 11 and nine or 11 and 10, excuse me, not 11 and nine, 11 and 10. Then I think I have at any point this season. And I, I say those words out loud and it sounds a little insane because at one point they were five and one and they also just benched uh, ostensibly their, their top off season acquisition. I know Evan Fortier, you know, got more money in more years. Well, we could talk about him in a minute, but like, am I crazy for having that feeling or did you feel like the Knicks found something in Brooklyn last night? I think they might've found something in Atlanta a couple mm. games before. I don't think you're crazy. I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily agree only because my opinion on them hasn't really wavered that much. Okay. I kind of came into the year thinking they were a top of the play in team. And I kind of just still think they're, around the top of the playing team. And if they're not that it's because like the wizards and the Hornets and the bulls are, are all really good. And I kind of thought they, you know, especially I thought the wizards would be like a bottom of the play in or miss the play in team. And, and that the bulls would be a play in team too. And it seems like they're better than that. Uh, but I, I think they're, I've had them around where I thought they would be the whole year. But that being said, like I thought they played really well in Atlanta uh, I wrote a thing yesterday morning after they made the Kemba change about kind of the defensive changes they were able to make just from a stylistic standpoint. They were able to play so much more versatile types of defense uh, when they when they start Alec Burks because everybody's tall, everybody's long, and they can switch everything or they can play things straight up. They could, they could, they could go to a million different types of coverages uh, and, and just having that versatility as a team is is so important. And I know they lost in Brooklyn. I actually thought they played really well yeah. In that game, uh, I thought it was defensively really, too. I know they gave up 110 points. I thought their defense was good. They were good. They played well. Uh, they, I thought it was a really good Randall game. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought we're gonna we're gonna get to him right now. <laughs> I, I thought it was like the best Randall game in a, in a long time, and not just because he made shots, but just the types of shots he was getting. Honestly, I know he went off on the refs after they. I shouldn't say he went off on the refs, but he was he was he was clearly Tibbs went off on the refs. He. 
Randall was just frustrated. Uh, but, but like, I don't know, maybe, maybe Knicks fans should just want referees to start calling <laughs> Randall the games like that all the time, because clearly the product of his frustration was, you know what? I'll show you. I'm going to go to the rim and keep getting I, fouled. I know. You know? I, it, and he um, was great. I thought in that game. he he was awesome. It it to me that I mean, and that's why I think I feel better this morning than I have at any point this year. Because even in the five and one start, like and we we've kind of talked about this offline. Like they were hitting an insane amount of shots. Like Kemba was had a sixty five effective field goal percentage. For you know they they were you know R J Barrett was going crazy. Um, but it it didn't really ever feel like they found an identity other than occasionally we're just going to shoot a ton of threes. They only shot, they didn't shoot that many threes last night and they certainly didn't make a ton, um, but they still had a performance that you could feel good about. Uh, you mentioned Randall. I wanted to save the conspiracy theory stuff for later in the episode, but let's just no, get to it right it. now. Do, do it, it right now. Okay. Do it. You, you texted me earlier in the year and you were like, something maybe seems a little off here with this team. And I mean, you, not that you were specifically talking about that, but you were just like generally. And ever since you did that, I've been, I can't get it out of my mind. I'm like, what is it that is not adding up here? And I'll be damned if I didn't see a team and a player in particular in Randall in Atlanta. And then especially last night, who's like, I'm going to remind you how well we did last year with that formula. And now that obviously Kem is out of the rotation, um, Am I? Do you think I'm going too crazy with that, or, or, or do you think I'm, I'm maybe on onto something? I don't know. Maybe he was he was really really good in the Brooklyn game. I just think he's such a different player when he attacks, yeah. and and I I think he took nine or ten shots at the rim in that game, and and look, it doesn't mean he has to attack every single time. Uh, you know, last year he had. I don't think anybody would argue the fact that he had the best year of his career last year. And if you look at the shot profile. It, he took more jumpers last year by far. I think sixteen uh, percent of his shots were at the rim last year, and that was you know in in half or or a third or forty percent, depending on the year of of his ratio from previous years. I mean, he yeah. comparatively he got to the rim less than any other season of his entire career. He was really a a roller before that. But when he's not hitting his jumpers and last year he was hitting his jumpers and he takes really difficult jumpers. Yeah. He was hitting his jumpers at a, an extraordinary rate. He has to figure out other ways to prop up his efficiency. So if he's going to shoot 42, 44 from mid range, I think it was 42 from mid range last year on a yeah, really crazy. high volume. And he's going to be 42 from three. Sure. Like bomb away at those jumpers. If that's what you normally are, if you're Kevin Durant, like take that, that's why Kevin Durant's like every time he's like, people say the mid range of bad shots. Like no one says the mid range is a bad shot for Kevin Durant. Tell, tell that's Chris Paul. Tell that to Devin Booker. Tell that to, you know, Chris Middleton, all these guys on the best teams in the league. Exactly. Kevin Durant could take a hundred percent of his shots from the mid range. He'll be one of the most efficient players in the league. Yeah. So it's, it's, those are, those are fine. So if Randall's going to hit it at that level, then go for it. But when he's shooting, when the jump shot is off as it's been this year, or at least not elite as it's been this year. Cause it's not like his three point shooting is terrible. Mid range yeah. shooting is way down. Yeah. Uh, he just has to find other ways to prop up the efficiency. Cause it's been his least efficient season of his career so far in part because of the jump shots and that the ratio is staying about the same. And you just want to see him get to the rim more like he did when he's not hitting those jumpers. And I thought he did a, made a concerted effort to do that. I thought the jumpers that he did took were, were totally fine looks. Uh, you know, maybe save for a few on Harden, whereas post ups carried him out to 18 feet, yeah. which is going to happen. Uh, and and he was he was passing well from from the start and and finding you know guys in the corner and all that. And I just I thought it was a it was a great game from him. I thought he played great. You you nailed it. I think it was a week or two ago when you um sp uh, in one of your you've been killing it all year. One of your pieces where you were talking about, you mentioned his post position and when, where he gets post position um, and how, when he, when he try when he tries to get post position, like 18 feet out, it's like, what do you, what are you doing? That's not an advantage creation situation um, last night. And, and this ties into Kemba for me, because one of the hopes that I had with Kemba coming here and, and I guess to a certain extent, Fournier is it was just going to open up the floor for more, for him to be able to get, better looks. And yet that wasn't happening at all. Um, so then, 
And then fast forward again to last night in, in Brooklyn, it, it feels like, I don't know, is that more him? I don't know. Is that the, the, the change in the lineup, whatever it is, it was better. And then the other thing that you, you wrote about in your most recent piece, which I mean, the fact that you tracked that what was that second spectrum data that you tracked down for the Burks oh, thing? The, the screening, the, screening. The, the switching data. Yeah. Yes, that was uh, I had to I don't have a second spectrum account. So I had to you have to be very important to get a second spectrum account. And I'm not important. But you're enough, a friend but... of the show. You're that's you're not that important. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I was well, I was I was able to call up somebody and say, uh, hey, you know, I'm a I'm a friend of Nick's film, film school. There you go. If that you did could, if you could give me some of this information, because I, I, I watched that game and they switched so much more in the Atlanta game. You could just, yeah. you know, I watched that. I've watched. I, I, I literally watched the Knicks for a living. And, uh, you know, I was, I, I've, I've watched every single second of basketball they played this year. And I'm watching the Atlanta game. I'm like, they never switch this much. And Kemba Walker is not in the starting lineup now. And Alec Burks is. And this is obviously how they want to play this game. They're just doing it way more. I was like, there's got to be second spectrum numbers on this that back it up. And turned out they switched about like three and a half times as much during the Atlanta game. Something I didn't include in that story was, uh, you know, I mentioned the Knicks have switched on fewer screens than any other team in the NBA this year. After the like going into the Atlanta game, they had switched on only 89 screens all year, according That's to insane. second spectrum. Yeah. And in the Atlanta game alone, they switched on 21. I, I, I want to go back and rewatch the, the Nets game. It, it feels like they were moving around a lot on defense, um, which you kind of have to do against that team. Uh, Burks is really good at that. Uh, someone who uh, defensively has been hit or miss this year. Uh, I referenced him earlier is Evan Fournier. I just saw there's a clip floating around uh, Twitter of when uh, Derek Rose checked into the game with uh, a whole three and a half minutes into the second half for Fournier. Tibbs, uh, I guess, was he was asking Tibbs, who am I checking in for? And, and Tibbs uh, somewhat vociferously yelled, uh, Evan. Um, I, I want to go big picture for a second because it sure feels like with Kemba now being benched, and with Fournier, again, taking a seat early in that third quarter, not something you maybe expect to see from your, your big offseason acquisition acquisitions between the two of them. I, I wonder how much Tibbs is, was on board with either of those signings from from the jump. And we know uh, your own Weissman has done some excellent reporting in terms of the dynamics of the front office and Tibbs. And, uh, you know, there's been perhaps some headbutting uh, here. Uh, over, you know, since Leon Rose came aboard, it it sure seems like, and I know you're into the analytics stuff, that Fournier and Walker are more analytics driven type of acquisition, you know, pull ups, shooting, obviously high three point percentages. I, I wonder, you know, if you if you had to guess, do you do you think that Tibbs, like, obviously he's got to play Fournier. He played him 22 minutes last night. But where, where do you think you think he likes? Do you think he, you think he was on board for those if you had to take a guess right now? I honestly don't know either way. What I can say is, I mean, we can use some deductive reasoning. I don't know I where he was. Deductive reasoning. I don't know where he was two months ago or three months ago, whenever the signings were, but um, we can use some deductive reasoning and we can say Kemba Walker is not just not starting. He is out of the rotation. Even after RJ Barrett gets sick and has to leave yeah. the game. And Evan Fournier is essentially not playing fourth quarters. So regardless of how he felt about it three months ago, he is, he is not playing them in a way that their contracts would imply no. the front office or the organization thought that they were going to be played when the signings happened. Um, and that so well independent said. of how Tibbs felt about it at the time, uh, you know, he's not, he's not rotating them like their contracts would imply. You'd think they would be when a guy signs a four-year deal or even look the Kemba contract, even if he never steps on the floor again with the Knicks. Like yeah. I, I understand the logic behind that. You know, people say it's a, it's a low risk move. It, it is a low risk move. And uh, you know, Seth part now had, had a, a good point on Twitter, you know, a colleague of mine where, where Seth said, you know, it's, it's, 
the low risk move only becomes a high risk move if you refuse to admit your mistake and continue yeah. to play the guy who's hurting you, even though he's got the not very high salary. You know, Kemba, Kemba signed for two years and 18 million. It's a consequential amount of money. Two for 18 is just, it's not going to kill your cap situation. It's for the most part, considering the cap sheet that the Knicks already had with the with the two to three to four year deals they ended up giving out to other guys this summer, it wasn't going to make a big difference in terms of their flexibility next off season. It's just, it's, and, it's worth the risk. I, I And with get free it. agency is being what it is this summer. And we're about to see a free, the quietest free agency. There'll be trades and signing trades and whatnot, but this isn't like, you know, summer of 2019 here we're talking about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, 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 I get that move. It's a low risk move. This is the worst case scenario that could have happened with the realistically with the low risk move. It's that he literally has to be out of the rotation. That is, that is the worst case scenario. And it's, it seems like a bigger deal emotionally and reputationally than it does from like a salary cap sheet sort of way. Like it's a bigger deal in the Kemba Walker direction than it is in the Knicks direction. If that makes sense. Yes. Um, I, I, uh, I was just thinking of um, of a certain uh, other beat writers piece from from uh, yesterday about the Kemba Walker camp. And uh, I, I guess this being a job saving move from uh, uh, Tom Thibodeau, because obviously Tom Thibodeau has to worry about keeping his job. Um, well, one thing I'll say about Tibbs, please. Yes. He, he is he really values lineup data. Yeah, you can tell yeah, he does. And. He he doesn't bring up the lineup data when it when it hurts, you know, when it when it's a derogatory towards a player because he's a coach and coaches don't do that. But he'll bring it up when it's a positive. And, and you've been you on go, this. You've been on this about I mean, the back. He brings it up about yeah. Rose all the time. Yep. The reason he leaves Rose with the reserves, the reason Derek Rose is not the Knicks starting point guard is because he looks at not just roses on offs and thinks, oh, it's clicking with the reserves. He's he 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 goes through the filters or has somebody in Nick's analytics going through the filters or has somebody in Nick's analytics telling him about the filters and he sees, ooh, what's what's quickly's uh you know what's what's the stats.mba.com slash averse when you when you throw up quickly and you see what what are quickly's on offs next to rose versus not next to rose. What are Burks's on offs? Next to rows, not next to rows. Wait, he, he what are toppins next to rows, not next to rows? And and he sees, hey, all of these are way higher next to rows. So I'm I'm not going to mess around with this. And he talks about that openly. And you know what? When you're that delved into the on-offs, and you 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 can't just look at that and not pair it with film and not pair it with you you know the eye test, you know, analytics in that sense. They're complementary to the eye test. They can show you some things maybe you weren't seeing that you go back and check and you're like, oh, I didn't realize that was happening. Or they can confirm what you are seeing. But that's part of the conversation and it's part of the argument in his mind for keeping Rose out there, which means, guess what? The inverse is true. He's he's looking at Kemba Walkers and he is saying, uh oh. This is this isn't good. And it's matching up with the eye test too. And and it's not like it just wasn't good. It was, and again, you You've been all over this in your recent pieces. It was, it was almost staggering. Like it, you almost had to do a, do a double take because the other, when you compare it to other teams in the league in terms of all five players, in terms of pairings, it's like he's lineups with Walker are in the same you know conversation as like Houston lineups and Piston lineups and uh, your old friends in uh, Oklahoma City, uh, although they've been spunkier uh, of late. Um, shout out. Yeah, to and, and, and you know what? You can do the same activity with Kemba Walker that you can with Rose where you say like, okay, what's, what's quickly with Rose compared to without Rose. You're like, Oh, you put Rose next to him and the well, Knicks kill. And Rose is the elixir. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's like when Rose is on the floor, the Knicks play at a ridiculous productivity, I, but with I, Kemba, it's like, you know, I had a lot of people, I tweeted out that, you know, the, when Kemba's on the floor going into the Nets game, when Kemba's on the floor, the Knicks have what would be the 30th, the dead last offense in the league or defense in the league. And when he is off the floor, they have what would be the best defense in the league and offense. It's like ninth when he's off and 27th when he's on or something. And 
I got a lot of replies and I get it. I didn't think it was a bad point that people would say, yeah, but you know, he shares almost all his minutes with Fournier. What about Evan Fournier? You know, he could be an Evan Fournier thing, except, and he does share almost all of his minutes with Fournier. The thing is Fournier doesn't share almost all of yes. his minutes with him. Yeah. Uh, about, about 25% of Fournier's minutes come without Kemba Walker on the floor. And those have been and a if, lot better. If you play the game, and you see, okay, what's Fournier without Kemba Walker? The Knicks are in the green when Fournier yeah. plays without Kemba Walker. Uh, you put Kemba Walker next to most players, and it's it's dragging down those net ratings. Then you have to go and you have to check, and you have to say, okay, why? What's happening? And 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 the thing that I at least think is the most interesting is just that they can play different stylistically, defensively. It's not that Burks is this elite all-world defender. It's just that he's capable of playing a number of different styles and, and offensively while Kemba's a very good shooter, his size just kind of makes it. So he, he needs a little more time to get off his shot. So while he's a good shooter, there's a reason why he was, you know, always an on ball guy. Well, it's not just because of his handling. It's because it's harder for a small guy to get his shot off, off the ball. And we know Tibbs has respect for, you know, I think that his term is like special players. When you have special players, like you, you, you know, you, you game plan around them is, is when he, when the Knicks have played somebody really good, like, and I made the point the other day, if this was, if this wasn't Kemba Walker, but like Kemba Walker, like the, the version of Kemba Walker that we've, that we've seen over, you know, hit over his Charlotte days, mostly, I think then you make the necessary concessions on the defensive end. Once that guy ceased to exist. And I don't know if that guy has ever been here this year. He certainly hasn't been here in terms of the shooting numbers since his, his hot start over the first six and seven games. So once you lose that piece and you're still giving up what you're giving up on the defensive end, that's why the one thing I've disagreed with is anybody who said, Oh, Tibbs learned his lesson from Alfred Payton. I don't think so at all. I think Tibbs knew, look, Alfred, he wasn't under any illusions as, as to what Alfred Payton was or was not as a basketball player, but he knew if he took it, put Alfred Payton out there, he would at least get to minute five of the first quarter. He wouldn't like occasionally they'd be in a hole, but usually it'd be like, okay, we're still in the game. Then you put in your subs and then you roll with it from there. Alec Burks, I think is almost like a slightly better version of that. Um, I think the question now moving forward, and I don't want to get too much into this because trade season doesn't even open up for two weeks is where do they go from here? It would not shock me if this was their this was their team, this was their rotation for the rest of the season, and they did not make any kind of a big move, you know, you know, give or take a uh, I don't know, a Kevin Knox uh salary dump. Can uh, could we call that now? Can we say to Kevin Knox salary dump? He's in salary dump territory, right? Um oh, but yeah, yeah I mean he hasn't where is he in the like where is he in the rotation? Like where what number he's last. is he? I mean, I do. Is, do, do, do I mean, Wayne, Wayne Seldon is last. I think he's. Oh yeah, Wayne's the guy Wayne above Seldon. Wayne Seldon. He's the guy above Wayne Seldon. It's not where you, not yeah. where you want to be. Um, I, the guy that I have my eye on moving forward, as I alluded to before, is Fournier. Um, I think it's a nice, it's a nice contract number. You know, you can you can put it with a smaller salary and bring in some bigger money. I don't expect that to happen this year. I expect that to be more of a summer thing. Um, do you? expect this to be basically the team we're going to see for the rest of the year? Or would it shock you if they went out and tried to try to do something? No, it wouldn't shock me if they went out and tried to do something. I don't, I, I don't expect like a major thing. I see Twitter was all over the place on John wall yesterday. I don't oh, see I, how, I was saving that question for last. <laughs> yeah. I don't see how that's possible. And quite honestly, <laughs> and even if it were, I, I don't know if that's the move for the Knicks for basketball reasons alone. I mean, yeah. I just, it's, he's a hard player to just take into your team in the middle of the year. He's got injury issues and like there, are, don't get me wrong. It's John wall, but like you have to reconfigure a whole offense when you have John wall, because he's now the guy, you know? So uh, on top of the fact that just money wise, it's like, okay, explain to me how this is going to work. Cause you can go Kemba and you can take like your biggest salary, non Randall territory and like Fournier and nope. And it would be Noel, I think would have to be, if it was a three for one, that's the only, or unless you want to, you know, trade like Burks yeah. and Rose. Which and you know what? Three for ones, four for ones don't really make sense during the season. Cause now yeah. the Knicks need to sign two more guys and the Rockets have to release that wave two or more. three guys. Exactly. So that just, it, it doesn't make sense. Also, that's just not a good trade. This is a bad basketball trade. Why would you trade away your whole team for a guy who's played like that's 30 it. games in four years? I got, I got people yelling at me because I was, I 
quote tweeted that uh, I, I shouldn't even call it a report yesterday that like, you know, Kemba for, for a while. And I'm like, no, this is, this is not true. It's like the money doesn't work. And people are like, well, if they, you know, put enough salaries together, I'm like, those trades don't happen in the middle of the season for, for the reasons you just said. Yeah, no, those are, those are off season trades. If they happen at all, there's a reason why John Wall is still on the Rockets. And, uh, you know, I hope John Wall comes back. I, I just, I wish you were playing. I hate the situation that's happening in Houston. I, I hate it. Uh, I wish do you, you think, were playing. Do you think, again, I know you haven't covered him for a few years. Do you think he, would it shock you if he came back and he had, I don't want to say what he had before the injury, but like if he had something real left to contribute to a team? No, it wouldn't. Cause the, the thing that people, I think don't know about John because in, unless you know him on like an individual level, because it doesn't always come through as much in his game where he can fall into modes where like, he's a little bit of a gunner and he's certainly ball dominant. He, his basketball IQ is as high as pretty much any player I've ever covered. Wow. Uh, he, he is like a savant on the game. He's he's one of my favorite players to just talk hoops and talks X, X's nose with of any player that I've ever covered. Uh, he will he has taught me a lot about the game. Just knows That's awesome. I mean, he is amazing to talk to, and he's kind of like a lawyer who can argue both sides. Uh, where he's he's someone and and covering Russell Westbrook, uh, who who doesn't really let you in to the degree that John does. You know, John will stay in. He'll like talk X's nose with you in your life. You see the the Pelicans game last night, and he'll be like, "Yeah, he's got he's got like three TVs in his living room, and he sits down and he he watches like three games at a time." Every really off night? Oh yeah, I mean he is totally. You can talk to him about like literally. You can talk to him about like girls, high school recruiting, <laughs> and like he's like, oh, nah, the seventh recruit, she should be number one. She's awesome." Like he is like a. It's insanity, his his level of just obsessiveness with basketball. Um, and with him, it's always been I've I think people see decisions that guys make on the court. And they think, oh, that means he's got a high IQ, or oh, that means he's got a low IQ. And I think what we sometimes forget is decision making can be born out of personality, not just mm. IQ. And with John, a lot of the stuff is, yeah, yeah, I see the guy in the corner, but like I'm John Wall. So this, this baby's going up <laughs> and, and that's uh, going to be interesting when he comes back. Does he still have the mentality of I'm John wall or can he accept if he's, can he look in the mirror and be like, well, I'm not that John wall anymore. Right. And so that's what it comes down to. And, and, and I think there's, there is zero question in my mind that John has the basketball intelligence to be able to lose athleticism, not be physically at this absolutely elite tier one athlete sort of level uh, and still be a good player because he is so smart and he knows the game and he's kind of like a lawyer that can argue both sides where you ask him like, Hey John, you were, you were double teamed on that play in the fourth quarter and end up putting up mid range shot and uh, you know, you had so and so open in the corner, and and you know he'll 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 like scramble your mind, answering it and being like, yeah, but if I go here, then so and so is going to help here, and you know when we played them two years ago, they were playing this kind of coverage against me, and so and so yeah. was here, and blah blah blah. I'm like, uh, okay, you somehow justified that that shot with 17 seconds left on the shot clock from mid range when they were somehow there were six guys guarding you. You're only allowed to have five guys in the court, but they somehow had six guys guarding for you, guarding you and you still shot it. Uh, and you somehow justified it. And so he'll, he'll play that game with you. And if he, if he just uses that intelligence in a different way to where I think it overcomes the AM hey, John wall, I can take that shot. Yeah, I could see it. I could see it. Well, they're not going to trade him. Um, this season, I guess, unless I don't know, does uh, does Houston want to take on like Kevin Love's salary? I'm trying to think if there's even another trade on the board that makes sense. I, I don't. I have absolutely no idea what that trade would be. Yeah, I don't. I mean, yeah, I don't. I, I think more likely maybe we get to the offseason and then they could have some uh, yeah. some. I mean, does out. Cleveland even want to do that? They've got yeah. Sexton. They've got Garland, and Garland's have. He's been really good and Ricky showing Rubio to be really good awesome. as a. Yeah. Exactly. Good I, I, ball handler. It's it's this seems headed for a buyout sooner rather than later. And listen, if and when he does hit the open market, I I, I would imagine the Knicks 
would kick the tires. And and you know what? For all the reasons you talked about, they probably should, um, you know, as another stopgap option. Um, let's finish up here because uh, I say stopgap option because the Knicks have been searching for a point guard for 40 years. I'm, I want to know just because I can't hide my adoration for him. What are your impressions of Emmanuel quickly so far this year? We didn't really talk about him much uh, when I had you on last time there. You could already hear it from some in the fan base, potentially even this, this podcast host there's you, you watch him on some possessions and there's, you feel like there's maybe a little, is there, is there stardom there underneath? And I know like last last night he had a possession where he got Aldridge on the switch and he couldn't break him down. And that's, that's like the last part. That's the part of his game that you kind of need to be a star in the NBA. Um, and he doesn't have those moves yet. Maybe he'll never get them. What, what do you, what do you see from, from quickly this year? Um, I think my next big long form story is going to be about the noises you make during Emmanuel quickly fourth quarter threes. Well, because my kids are sleeping. So it's like, I can't just yell because if I yell, I'm going to wake them up. So it's like, I am cognizant of the fact that I can't just yell out loud at the top of my lungs. So I have to make like some kind of muted noise and it comes out like a, some kind of like a squeak or something. It's not what you want at all. Um, yeah. I like, I like that this justification implies that like there's, of course, there's a noise. There can't just be no noise. No, there cannot be no noise. <laughs> there has to be some kind of Yelp or gulp or something. It's a Yelp. It's a Yelp. It's a small Yelp, but it's a Yelp. <laughs> well, I think it quickly. Um, I think I think more so than him being able to like take down guys on mismatches and after switches and that kind of stuff. I think the the big thing for him in not ending up, you know, I think like Lou Williams is the guy who people compare him to the most. And I would say I would compare him to that role. But I think the big difference between him and Lou Williams is that Lou Williams is this elite, elite pick and roll guy. Like, yes, Lou Williams is the all-time leading scorer off the bench in the history of the NBA. And he's won, what, three, six man of the year awards. Yeah, that sounds right. But even in like he look, he really won four six man of the year awards because he got Montrez Harrell. Montrez his, Harrell. You well, know? their their pick and roll points per possession like led the league that that one year with the Clippers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was absolutely devastating, and he just has this incredible timing on pick and rolls. He genuinely like he's not Jamal Crawford. Uh, no. He genuinely makes guys around him better, and I think if quickly is gonna evolve out of being that microwave scorer off the bench, which I think he could be very good at ultimately what it comes down to. And there are certain individuals he has good chemistry with. Like he has good chemistry with Obi. They have Mm -hmm. good lob chemistry. Uh, But what he needs is kind of that, that ability to be able to see passes to guys who he doesn't just have the individual chemistry with and, and, and make others around him on the floor better. And I don't think that's something that he generally has right now, which is fine second year player. And I don't think the Knicks are putting him in a position to where he has to be able to do that. Uh, And that doesn't even mean that he has to do that to be a good player. He's already a good player. But I think if we're talking about next step, I think that would be the thing I would, if I were the Knicks, I would want to see from him the most uh, as well as just the ability to get to the rim more. Like to me, I know people love his floater. I know people love his floater and it is a really good floater in the realm of floaters but ultimately, even really good floaters are not very efficient shots, even if you make them at an okay rate, because you just don't get fouled on them. Yeah. So if he's just normally a floater is a concession, or at least in my mind, it should be a concession shot. It's, oh, we're playing the jazz and Rudy Gobert is there. Or it's, I'm just not able to get to the rim on this play for whatever particular reason, but I have a really good floater, so I can put it up here. Uh but to me, the priority should always be getting to the rim because you can't. It's not just finishing there; it's going to get you the line more. That's something that he's been down on a little bit more. So I, I think his ability to be able to get all the way to the rim, not not seven feet from the rim, would be a, a really nice development for him too. But hey, he's getting better defensively too. Like, oh my he's god, way better defensively. I I've said a few times. I think you could argue that he's been the Knicks' 
best perimeter defender this year. I know RJ has had some moments. Burks is solid. Rose is very underrated at this point in his career. I, he, he's got, I think this is the best defensively Rose has ever been. Um, but yeah, quickly is really good. Um, I'm excited about him. I'm, I'm excited about the team. Uh, I'll be curious. Do you think when you say star, I want, I want your perspective. When you say star underneath there, what is that to you? To me, like the, the comp that I came up with like last week, I think it was, was Jason Terry as a ceiling. You know, Jason Terry, I don't think he ever made an all-star team. He averaged close to 20 points a game a few times, but he was like, was he the third most important player on that Mavs team? The fourth, depending on how you feel about like Jason Kidd at that point in time in his career, like someone like that. And I think, again, we saw like he played his career high in minutes by, by he overshot it by five against Brooklyn. Like I, I, to me, that's an indication that Tibbs knows he's got something there and it's good. But, it, but again, like, we, we you nailed it. We haven't seen those couple of things that like, again, when you talk about star players in the NBA, you got to have those extra couple of things. And you're right. He's not there yet. I just wonder, because he seems like such a hard worker and a good kid, you know, does he get there at some point? And I don't know what that looks like if he gets there. It's possible. It's possible. We just haven't. Yeah. I mean, sometimes guys just develop stuff. Sometimes RJ just comes back and he shoots 40% from three, you know? <laughs> Sometimes let's, guys let's, just develop stuff. Let's hope uh, let's hope that happens again. Hope uh, RJ is feeling better as well. Um, I got to get out of here. You got to get out of here uh, before I let you go. Of course, please. Can you tell the folks at home where they could find uh, you and your excellent stuff? Yes. Uh, subscribe to The Athletic. Um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Fred Katz. You can follow me on Instagram, Fred Katz MBA, where I, I, I keep telling myself I want to be more active and then I keep forgetting about it which is not a great plug to follow me Who are on you Instagram. Kidding? You're not yeah. kidding anybody here. Yeah. Yeah. Just not. I'm just not. I'm just honestly, just follow me on Nick's film school. I'm a friend of the show now. So you can um, there too. I have, um, I have loved, absolutely loved uh, your stuff this year. Um, writing about the team. You really do. Like, it seems like you enjoy getting into the, the data and the numbers and the stuff and like uncovering yeah, it, you know, you're you could tell you're a you're a you're a basketball nerd, which is why you're a friend of the show. <laughs> um, you have a little bit of a ways to go to get to Mark Berman status. I mean, he really that's up high here. But you know, if you keep studying up the game, maybe one day you'll you'll get there. Hey, Berman's a legend, man. I was reading Berman growing up. I was reading Berman when I was a kid. So he is. He is he is as much an institution as the as the floor in Madison Square Garden. Um, and uh, on that note, Fred, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on. And we'll, uh, of course, have you on again very soon. Thanks for having me.